Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 21 Hats Podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Feldman. This week, Sean Bussey, Liz Picarazzi, and Jackie Russo discuss what they learned in 2023 and what they expect from 2024. After a tough year, Sean is optimistic that his clients, having survived the turbulence of the past few years, are ready to spend money and try something different. Liz explains why she's been willing to discount her products as much as 40% on Cyber Mondays and tells us about some new products she has in the works. Early in the year, Jackie, thinking she was going to have to staff up to handle two big new clients, dove into remodeling her offices. But those clients have yet to sign on. I might have jumped the gun a little bit, says Jackie. Plus, Liz talks about her Midwestern mom, who can't understand how Liz can charge so much for her trash enclosures, and Sean raises the issue of how much money business owners should spend on marketing. Even in good times, owning and running a business can be a lonely pursuit. Our hope is that these weekly conversations, brought to you by our principal sponsor, The Great Game of Business, will let owners know they are not alone in facing challenges. And, by the way, I've just published an interview with Josh Birch, CEO of Keep Supply, who practices open book management, which is one reason he and his wife, who have six kids, decided early in the pandemic to sell almost everything and move from Missouri to Europe, where Josh has been running his refrigeration parts business remotely. Once a quarter, I publish an interview with a great game practitioner, and this is that story. You can find it in your morning report and at 21hats.com. Joining me this week on the podcast are regulars Sean Bussey, CEO of Kinesis, which is based in Portland, Oregon, and works with small businesses on marketing, culture, and strategy. Liz Picarazzi, CEO of CityBin, which is based in Brooklyn, New York, and makes trash enclosures and package bins. And Jackie Russo, CEO of Brand Russo, a marketing agency based in Lafayette, Louisiana. The episode is titled, What Are Your Goals for 2024? Welcome, Sean, Liz, and Jackie. It's great to have you here. Before we get going today, I just wanted to denote, in case you missed it in your 21 Hats Morning Report, we've got another 21 Hats Live event coming up. It's going to be in Fort Worth at Laura Zander's uh, Madeline Tosh Factory. It's going to run from Wednesday, March 6th to Friday, March 8th. And it's going to be your chance to meet Jackie, Sean, Liz, and pretty much all of the 21 Hats podcast crew. If you want more info, you can just shoot me an email at lauren at 21hats.com. All right. Now that uh, 2023 is just about in the books, I want to ask you, what was this year like for you? Did it go as well as you hoped? Did you learn anything? Jackie, suppose we start with you. I feel like it's always a learning experience. And the big lessons that I learned this year, we had some huge project, uh, new clients lined up at the beginning of the year was going to require staffing up. And we started a remodel to make room for the new people. Well, we are completing the remodel tomorrow. We move into um, our current team into that new space and it's gorgeous and exciting. And the two huge global clients still haven't signed 10 months later. (laughs) And so I've learned a lesson about moving faster than my circumstances allow. And so that's been a valuable lesson. Um, It's a good year for us. It's going to end up being in our 23-year history. It's going to be our our third biggest. So, you know, I I have no complaints there, but I've got big plans for 24. Well, we'll get to those. Are you sorry you're moving into the new space or? No, not at all. So we bought the whole building in 05 and we only occupied two thirds of it. And um, it was inevitable that we would take over the final third. Eventually, the tenant had moved out. We used part of it as a a workshop rental space, but the other part of it was going unused. And so I am excited. I think for the most part, our uh, philosophy, which has held true for 23 years, it's always cheaper to do it today than to do it tomorrow. And so uh, and we, we got a great rate, so I can't complain about that. So I'm glad we have room to grow into. The new offices are so nice. My creative team is so happy. It makes them want to come into the office. Another reason Um, that we have provided to create more internal collaboration and actually being in the same room together. So it's good. I just, I might've jumped the gun a little bit, but you know, I'm all gas. That's sort of my speed. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, Jackie, tell us a little bit about the financing side of things. So you bought an 05 when rates were not particularly amazing, but I'm sure you've refinanced it since then. Where are things at now? We did refinance. I want to say the building is at 2.6. 
And uh, this remodel is a little bit more than that, but still sub four. So, you know, that feels like free money. Yeah. Or especially today. Yeah. How long does that, does the term of that note last? 15 years. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So we'll have the building and this remodel well paid off before I think about retiring. Wow. So Jackie, it, it was your third uh, biggest year, but uh, you had expected to do more when the, when the year started. Is that correct? Correct. We expected it to be the biggest year and I, you know, acted accordingly. So I'm very pleased that we have um, had the growth we've had. We have improved so many processes this year. We are doing so many things smarter. We've, um, you know, upped our game from a technology perspective even more. So I feel really good about it. I'm just, you know, I'm never satisfied. Did going ahead with the remodel while not getting those two big clients, did that have an impact on your profitability for the year? Oh, it did. It very much did. It kept those two clients single-handedly kept this from being the biggest year we've ever had uh, because that's how big they are. And I think the lesson in that is, you know, we've never tried to have any one client be that much bigger than the others. We've had that once uh, years ago. And when after our four or five years together, it came to a natural conclusion and it was a huge impact to us. And so I think in a lot of ways, I'm spared um, from having my business be lopsided and this has given us a chance to add on some uh, regular size clients so that when the big ones do say yes next year, because it still looks like it's happening, we'll be more balanced. Just quick question, Jackie. To you, what's a big client say in terms of annual billings or, or revenue to your firm? Um, you know, our, our average size is about 250, 300, and this would have been about 750, 800. Wow. Big. Wow. Okay. So big, big difference. Big. Yeah. Sean, how are you thinking about this year? What's it what you hoped it would be? Looking backwards, um, I mean, I was very, very realistic at the start of the year. I knew it was going to be a really hard year for us. Our market sector, where we work with owner-operated businesses, that's it. We don't, we don't work with large corporations or even mid-market corporations. So uh, there's just a lot of, uh, within our market sector, there's just a lot of uncertainty, right? The constant drumbeat of like, oh, are we in a recession yet? Are we in a recession yet? That really gets to folks and what it causes them to do is to tend to play defense and 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 to not take action. You know, kind of like Jackie's example of even at a larger, larger firm size. So growth for us this year, this has been probably our first year where we've actually not had positive growth in uh, 13 years. Um, so so it's been a it's been a real challenge. I um, feel very grateful that all the things we've done up until this moment have really positioned us to kind of handle these kinds of situations. So we have a really great line of credit. We have really long tenure with our employees, with our customers. A lot of it's been rebuilding our marketing. And so that's that's taken a lot of effort. You also are uh, moving into remodeled space, a new office yeah. that you haven't given up your previous one uh, early in COVID. How's that going? That's been a real bright spot, you know, for two reasons. One is that the commercial office market right now is is just in a lot of pain. So our ability to negotiate a really fantastic deal was like unbelievable. I, it's like nothing I've ever seen in 20 years. You know, the willingness of the landlord to accept the terms that we had were just kind of amazing. <laughs> uh, so So that's great. And then, you know, I think the more important part is just the opportunities that are being created by coming in and, and working in shared space. It's just, you cannot replace that. I, I really believe that, um, both from a sense of camaraderie and collaboration and the I, I, ideation, creativity that are happening versus remote. And then also from a client perspective, just having prospects and clients into your space, it just it just has a different impact than when you meet with them on Zoom. And I should have done this sooner, probably, probably a year earlier, but I'm glad I did it. And it's it's really been it's really transformative for us. Did you get any pushback from employees who had gotten used to not commuting, not coming in? None at all. No, I, if anything, I got a lot of folks expressing how grateful they were, especially folks that have kids at home. I think the the home office environment with kids in it, especially during the summer, or we just had a teacher strike recently. 
oh my God, <laughs> the parents were miserable, you know, because their kids weren't in school. And uh, yeah, they're, they're just really excited to be coming into the office. I will say this, we're not heavy handing it. You know, we're not telling folks, hey, you've got to come in this many days a week. There's, there's much more of an organic approach to when we work in the office. And, and I think that creative flexibility and freedom is really well received. I don't, I don't know, Jackie, what's, what's kind of been your approach to that? I'm curious, you know, because you run a creative shop too. So I do. Um, we've had, you know, we're kind of half creative, half strategy. And so I, I run the strategic team, which includes the research team and the, what I think of as the doers, uh, PR, social media, account management, uh, that's all my group. And then Michael runs the creative team, which are the graphic designers, the copywriters, videographers. That's your husband, right? Yeah. Also known as husband and father of our four children. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's a whole podcast to itself, Lauren. Like that's some marriage counseling we probably don't want to get into on the air. We've hit on that a little bit in the past, no. but we're going to come back to Anytime it. Anytime <laughs> you want. It's one of my favorite topics. We actually, our two hour professional development that we do every month, we bring in a, a therapist who's a coach who guides us through different exercises. And, and today's session was on effective communication. And it did probably turn into the Russo's marriage counseling session at one point, but <laughs> we managed to turn it around and make it very positive and, and professional. But to answer Sean's question, eventually, for the 23 years uh, we've been in business, you know, we started the company when I was eight months pregnant with kid number two. Number three was the next year. Number four was the next year. So we've always had a very flexible um, when you work and where you work approach. We hire adults. It's not about their age. It's about their ability to self-manage. And uh, we just expect the work to get done. And if it's not working the way you needed to or we needed to, let's have a conversation and find a way to make it work better. But if you need to not work in the morning because you're going to your kid's thing at school, then my expectation is you're going to work faster or smarter or a little bit more at the end of the day to get it done. And as long as everybody gets it done, we're fine. And that's worked pretty well for us. There's a couple of occasions where that's fallen off. So in 2020, when everybody went home, we were like, oh, okay, we're already set up. Everybody had server access from their houses. Everybody has high-speed internet at their houses. So that didn't throw us for a loop. As we've come back to work you know, in the past two years, we've just done a better job of explaining we need to have some connection. So we have these professional developments. Everybody was responsible for an open or a close at some point during the week. So they at least touch base. They come in the building. We see their faces. We get to know they're okay. Uh, but then otherwise, we work on Zoom. Sean, are you trying to get people to come in on specific days or is it completely uh, open? You know, one of our team members did something really interesting just spontaneously. And he started doing a poll kind of at the end of the week on Slack saying, okay, here's Monday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, next week. Uh, raise your hand. Who's going to be in on what days? And so people would just start to like put their little emoji next to the day of the week or multiple days of the week. And it was kind of interesting to sort of see that manifest and how, you know, certain folks would come in on certain days and some folks would come in together on the, on the same time. And that's been pretty cool. I think a really powerful lesson I've learned over the years in terms of leadership is that the best kind of uh, engagement and buy-in is when folks kind of create their own path forward instead of it being imposed on them. And so watching this happen has been pretty exciting to see. We've, we've talked as a leadership team about, you know, hey, should we have a dedicated day or certain times? And, and then this thing has kind of popped up. And then to also see things like we have a client coming in, a prospective client coming in next week. And the team raised their hand and said, hey, let's make sure as many of us are in the office as possible so they can get a sense of who we are and, you know, that we we have heft and horsepower. And I didn't say that. That, that came from like a designer. That came from a graphic designer. You know, you read these articles about corporations forcing their people in or not or whatever. And I think a lot of these problems are due to the fact that they don't have very high employee engagement. The employees actually don't really care that much about the businesses they work for. So you get a lot of that friction. So I don't know. I'm, I didn't expect it, but I'm really delighted by it because I have a tendency to want to be like a benevolent dictator. <laughs> I'm like, I'm letting, I'm letting go of those impulses as I get older. And it's pretty exciting to see what's happening. Liz, how are you thinking about 2023? Um, so I feel really good about it. Not as great as I would like to. Um, but I think most people feel that way. So this was our biggest year yet revenue wise. 
growth wise, it was not, we didn't grow as much as we wanted. And it's interesting that Jackie says that part of her year was that she didn't get retained a couple of important clients. We really had that concentration as well with some of our municipal clients and particularly New York City. So while we were able to recover the revenue that we had in government contracts last year, it still was something that we were a little bit surprised by. And um, I think really the climate in New York City with trash is rapidly changing. If you look in (laughs) the New York Times any other week, you're going to see something about trash or rats. But the sanitation department is experimenting with a lot of different things. And City Bin was just one of them. So there, we still are all over New York City. We're in five boroughs. We continue to get business from business improvement districts, you know, that have their own budgets. But in terms of like getting a big city contract, it's actually not even something I'm pursuing anymore. So in terms of the finances from 2023, I'm feeling good, but not great about it. You know, I am a grandiose entrepreneur. So (laughs) every year I'm going to say I want to double. I'm going to double. double. I remember that (laughs) you were going to double at the beginning of the year. And I'm like, wait a minute. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know. But you have done it, right? Yeah. But last year, not this year. So. Right. But that is about really the concentration of clients in municipal In terms of also 2023 and our mission, um, we have kept thousands of trash bags out of sight and contained in New York City and many other cities, many other public spaces. Our work just looks incredible. When I look at photos of my own work, I have to say I'm very proud of the bins and how well they beautify um, a lot of neighborhoods, commercial corridors. So that's been really gratifying. Also feeling good about some of the new products that we've developed, um, some of which we haven't even rolled out yet. So we just did the photography for some of the new products that we, that we're pushing out. And that's, you know, in January, that's going to be really exciting. Can you give us a hint? What's, uh, what's to come? Sure. So um, we have a couple of different sizes where we can either go vertically or horizontally with the bins. And we're going to be marketing um, a double depth is what we call it, a double depth bin that will fit twice as many bins in it. And we've been using that a lot in New York City, of course, um, where there's such a space constraint that many, especially many large buildings they're not using their space efficiently unless they have this sort of a double depth configuration because they don't have um, the width to um, have enough trash cans in the areas. We've done a couple of these over the years, but they've always been custom projects. And it's actually something that we're going to be fabricating um, on a mass uh, production level. And then the other big one is composting. So we have modified a bin that we're going to be using for composting. We haven't started marketing it, but we are piloting it in Boston now. Um, and that's gone really well. So that those will be a really big focus next year. I think that we're poised for a really great 2024. So uh, from a composting perspective, are you seeing that growing in other cities? Because like here in Portland, we've been doing it a long time and it's it's uh, it's actually pretty cool, but there's not good answers for uh, like I just, our new building. Like they have this composting situation it is not pretty. Uh, so I'm just sort of curious. Is that a, you feel like that's a growth area? I do not for residential, but for public community composting. I mean, the bins that we have in Boston are for community composting. And I, I think it's probably not a huge group. In New York, at least for residential, we do have our own composting bins. I just restarted composting a couple months ago because the city restarted in Brooklyn. And I can attest to how gnarly the cans can get even after a couple of weeks. You know, if you're not, if you don't line them, if you let rain get into them, the maggots, (laughs) I'll say the gross (laughs) word, (laughs) there are maggots. But, you know, if you look in a lot of trash cans, you're going to see them too. But it's... uh, It's so important and it's really hard to get people to change their behavior. Liz, has your business moved more in the direction of municipal than residential in the past year or two? Definitely in the last two years. In the last year, I would say we've moved more to like 50-50. 
Whereas before it maybe was like, I don't know, 10 to 15%. So it definitely has shifted. And a lot of my priorities for next year are in the municipal realm. How does that change things for you? We really want to replicate success that we've had in New York and other cities. And we've already done a good amount of that, but it is going to take kind of perpetual marketing to continue to be that the brand that we are known as for municipal containerization. So I want to keep that going. Um, you know, we do have a couple of competitors in the space and I know that I've beat them um, into, you know, some of these cities, um, but they're probably better funded than me. And so for me, especially in the early part of the year to be really hardcore on the marketing and the reach outs to cities is going to be important. I assume the marketing is very different if you're aiming for business districts as opposed to residential. It very much is. And Lauren, with you as a writer, you'll probably appreciate that I wear many hats when I write copy for different audiences. I love it when people say that, Liz. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes I'm writing for the bear audience. Sometimes I'm writing for the city audience. Sometimes for property managers of multifamily buildings, sometimes of single family homes. And I do have a writer that's helping with a lot of that, but I still do write a lot of the copy and I'm happy I've gotten a lot better at it. But when I first started having new segments, I did struggle with it and would drag my feet. But now it's pretty easy to sit down and know, okay, I'm sending this postcard to Aspen. What should it say? Uh, Liz, I'm kind of curious. We've got three marketers on this. This is kind of funny. So we have three folks who have marketing or marketing adjacency. So how much energy, time, money do you think you put into marketing? I don't know, express it maybe as a percent of revenue or, yeah, I'm kind of curious how you think about that. Have you ever quantified your time and your cost? I'm not going to speak on the financials of it because I am not close enough to know if it's like 10% or 25%. It's not, it wouldn't be that much, but I would like to be more accurate. In terms of my time on it, I would say if you bundle kind of lead generation, business development and marketing, that it's probably over half of my time. Yeah. Yeah. And then what other resources do you have to support you in it? So I have kind of an internal um, person and a half. Um, and then I also have three external contractors. Some of them are very, they're not full time. Like I have one person that literally just does renderings for our proposals He's amazing. We can take a picture of any corner, New York City, anywhere that has trash bags, you know, on the corner. And we superimpose the bins on them. And those go into both our proposals that have been requested. But I've also been known to send unsolicited proposals to people. And that is that's been a really great resource. You know, anytime we have a brochure. Or another has that worked? I think so. I can't say for absolute sure, because with some of those business improvement districts, we had several touch points. But I think they do appreciate that we've taken the time to do that. And it's really a super effective way for us to show the difference. Because if you're in charge of a commercial corridor and there are trash bags on every corner, that's actually a pretty big burden on you to solve a problem that can be solved with city bin. So, yes. So you said one and a half, you're at least half time. So you're talking at least two internal people plus a team of part timers on the outside. So maybe three FTE equivalents, something like that. No, total. I, no? I overstated it. Some of the people that are internal are not 100%. So one person uh, okay. is probably only like 30%. She deals with a lot of other things. So what do you think the FTE equivalent is once you add all that up? I would probably say one and a half. And your company size, number of people? We have seven. Actually, if I include everybody, it's nine. Nine. Okay. So about uh, 10 to 15% of your workforce, give or take? Yep. Yeah. Probably, yeah. Yeah. Jackie, what do you think? That's your, you might have more, been, you're a little larger. So if you quantified this more for yourself, like how much time, money, effort you're spending on marketing? Well, I mean, on the one hand, like you, Sean, everything we do is is marketing all day long, whether we're doing it for our clients or doing it for ourselves. I think that like most agencies, we probably have had patches where we didn't spend nearly enough time on ourselves because we were really busy with client work. And I didn't like that peak uh -huh. and valley of it. And yeah. I, I'm never fond of that 
cobbler's kids have no shoes kind of philosophy because you should be your own best client. And so we got really serious about three years ago of saying, we're going to practice what we preach. We're going to test everything on ourselves and we're going to make sure that we have a real plan in place. And I think over time, we've gotten better and better. Uh, This past 23 was our best year yet in terms of making sure we had a content strategy and we stuck to it. We honored our own podcast. We, you know, made sure our blogs were out on time. (laughs) You know, we did the things we're supposed to do and we've seen the benefits of it. So I'd be crazy not to. We don't have any one person 100% dedicated to the marketing for our agency. Our PR team treats Russo like a PR client. Our social media team treats Russo like a social media client. And so everybody has Russo, or every team, not every person, has Russo assigned to them. So we make sure that we get the same amount of attention and quality of work that we need. Uh, you're what? Uh, how many? How many people are you? Twenty, thirty, something in that I'm range. Only about twenty four. Twenty four. Yeah. 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 I, I. You know, this is all kind of a leading question, and part of it is, you know, Lauren, you're asking to look backwards and then look forwards, right? And I was on a call the other day with my financial consultant, and he has what he calls his hundred company model, and the, it's a hundred businesses. Kind of in that, you know, five million to ten million dollar range, you know, probably some on the smaller side, you know, in that two million. But I really like their model because it captures a lot of different industries and, you know, like a realistic small business size. And he said it's it the model has started to massively bifurcate, meaning there's about half of the companies in there are declining and about half of them are growing. He said that the growing group is spending on average 8% or more on their marketing. And the shrinking group is spending 3%, which I was like, wow, that is such a tiny number. And, and I, it just kind of goes to my thesis that, and, you know, I know this is going to sound self-serving, but I think most companies massively either underspend or undervalue the amount of marketing they're actually doing. You know, like to Liz's case, right? She is the most expensive most talented person on the team and she's spending half of her time on marketing. And I I think a lot of owners don't recognize just how complex marketing has become. And as a result, how much energy you have to put into it. And I think that's an important lesson as to thinking about the future. I'm thinking about that myself because like you, Jackie, we went through periods of time where like, oh yeah, Kinesis is a client of Kinesis, but also like the lowest priority client, (laughs) you know? So... (laughs) Liz, I get your uh, company emails and I saw that you did a big Cyber Monday sale. I'm curious, did that work for you? It did. And it actually does every year. We only do that big sale once a year and for only one day and Cyber Monday. It was like 10 to 20% off, wasn't it? It was actually 20 to 40% off, but only one product was 40% off. And it should be no surprise that it was the package locker that Frank hates and is trying (laughs) to get rid of. So he's trying to fire sale them and get us out of the package locker business. But then interestingly, we did get a lot of requests. We did get a lot of purchases of that. So what does that say? Did they buy it because it was 40% or because they've wanted one for a long time because they think it's great and they would love for it to continue? One thing that's interesting with it is that we do use HubSpot for our email marketing. And when we send out a mass email like that, we do them twice a a week just during the regular year. We don't often look at the specifics of who's opening it and how many times are they clicked? You know, did they get into the Shopify basket or not? But on the day of the sale, we basically have the HubSpot open all day and we see who's clicking it the most, who uh, got to the basket but didn't finish checking out. And if they're people that we've already been working with and we know, okay, this person's opened it 30 times in the last two hours, which can happen and did happen, then we know to get in touch with them, to do a one-on-one with them. The other interesting thing with our sale this year is that each year we've actually gone down on what the percentage um, promo is. So a couple of years ago, it was actually 40%. And we figured we're going to do it really high because it really is only once a year. And maybe we're not going to be profitable on it but we're going to get a lot of buyers that otherwise wouldn't buy. That was way overly generous. And especially because it's, it's our biggest uh, revenue day of the whole year. Um, and then last year we put it to 25%. And then this year we decided to put it 20%. And 
we still feel that that's a really generous discount. Um, the only other people that get that discount is if it's a you know property manager, or contractor, or city that's buying in a large volume. That's really our our deepest discount with with those groups. This is so interesting. I'm just suddenly realizing you built like a pretty significant B two C thing. So, do you know what your breakdown is between B two C customers and B two B customers, or B two G in terms of government? I actually did that calculation probably a year ago. If I and I don't even remember what it was then, but if I were to guess what it is now, I would say it's probably thirty percent B two G. 30% B2B, and then the last 40% B2C. Sometimes moves around. And the other thing, it's like, do I classify a property manager, which is a business, as residential or as B2B? And sometimes I kind of conflate those and it's hard to disentangle. But I, that is yeah. definitely going to put that down as something we should do. Yeah, that's really interesting because it's just been my experience that b 2 b to c takes a ton of money. You know, it's just like a really costly customer acquisition process, whereas B2B is more, tends to be more strategic and that the wins tend to be bigger and long, take longer. Yeah, that's true. And, and I also, I did more just like online marketing B2C, not too much, but over a couple of years, I spent probably, I don't know, 10, $20,000 on it, which was, was a lot. And I barely got any conversions. And then finally, I realized, you know, online marketing is best if you're selling like a sweater. It's not great if you're selling a $4,000 aluminum trash enclosure. People are not going to make a spontaneous decision based on an Instagram ad. So we just stopped it completely. We were doing, you know, AdWords. We did some Instagram. We did some Facebook. So for B2C, you know, we're just relying on People that come to the site and sign up for the newsletter, which is substantial because they also get the discount for it. Um, definitely a lot of word of mouth. PR. We do get a lot of right? PR. I mean, yeah. that's your thing. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of your driver, right? I mean, because why would people visit your website? It's probably because they saw an article about you, right? A lot of the time, yeah. Because we can see from where they came in from, too. <laughs> Jackie, if, aside from realizing that you were a little too generous with the discount, did you have any concerns about discounting uh, at all, just in terms of the potential for it to, to cheapen the product in some way? You mean Liz? Uh, yes, I did mean Liz. Thank you. <laughs> and I was like, we don't discount our services, Warren. I am opposed to that morally. Yeah, and I'm sure Jackie would say that um, I wouldn't be spending 50% of my time on marketing if I worked with someone like her. <laughs> Actually, no. You know, I, I really feel like there's, there's three ways everybody should be going with their marketing, and they have to evaluate what's right for them on a lot of reasons. Obviously, on the one hand, hire an agency. But you've got to be the right size and have a real need for growth and be willing to invest. To Sean's point earlier, if you're not looking at spending 8%, don't spend it on an agency because you're not going to get enough return on that investment to have the growth you need. The second are the people who need some help, but don't need a full agency. And that's why we built Brand State U. And we have a whole online education platform to teach people to be better marketers because they have to do it themselves. And then there's the group that's just out there on their own trying to figure it out. And God bless y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I agree. I agree with Jackie on that one. Liz, let me ask you, did you have any concerns when you did the, the first Cyber um, Monday discount uh, about the impact it could have on the brand? I did. Um, I did at the time, but then I experienced that it didn't have an impact because it's in terms of the communications, it's really only several days of communications that go out. They're pretty isolated. We also do a targeted list. We don't do it to everybody. And now I will say that there are several people that have the email blast from three years ago that say 40% off that will still try to redeem it. <laughs> you won't get back and beyond. That's ridiculous. Right. And which is funny because no, the sale was literally only for one day three years ago. Wow. So it's isolated. It's isolated to one day and to one year. And you know, it doesn't happen too often. I guess if I were the consumer, I might try to do that too. But it's funny. <laughs> When it happens. It's okay for Liz to be cheap, but her customers better not be. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I should see if my mom's listening to this because she always, she's a Midwesterner, you know, like me, you do not spend that much money on anything and definitely not on your trash. She's always like, 
Elizabeth, I don't know how you can get so much money for those things. Oh, my God. <laughs> Ouch, you know, like, <laughs> lovingly, yes. But, you know, it's probably why I'm not spending anything marketing in Wisconsin. Well, can I can I provide some unsolicited feedback, which is usually criticism, I have learned. But this is not. This is to uplift what you just said. Mm -hmm. I think you need to do a whole ad campaign around mom. <laughs> no, I'm you know, I was thinking the same thing as you were doing Lauren the voice. I agree. I want mom talking about how ridiculous it is and how expensive it is. And no one should waste their money like that. I mean, there's a whole family dynamic there that may send y'all to therapy, but it could also be hugely <laughs> impactful because you're going to cut through the clutter. That's the last thing I expect you to tell me. I want to see photos of mom shaking her head disapprovingly. I want to see videos of mom talking to, you know, tapping her <laughs> finger and just like, no, it will drive sales. <laughs> I will consider that. <laughs> Although, you know, Jackie, we haven't known each other that long, but, you know, Lauren and Sean will tell you that I have like 300 ideas right now that are competing. Oh. I'll add that as the 300 first. Okay. I'm fine with that letter, <laughs> that order of priority. I'm last to arrive. Uh, but I think there's something here we should play with at some point. Yeah. Jackie, you told us before that you're really excited about next year. Uh, I want to ask all of you this. Uh, tell me, why are you excited about next year? I'm excited about next year for a lot of reasons, Lauren. I don't think that I'm ADHD. I feel like I'm very kind of on a path. And so I, I'm not usually squirrel chasing, but I got a lot of irons in the fire right now and they're making me equally excited. And so that's kind of fun. For the agency, every time we make a, a, a shift, a change, an improvement, I see the results of that. So I feel really good about some changes we're making currently in elevating our content. Are you going to get those two clients? Uh, well, yeah, they're coming too. So that makes me excited. And there's, there's two others who have pushed us to January, but they keep calling us. So we feel really good that the January is the lock. So we should start with four new ones in the first two months. So that makes me happy. The Brand State U that I referenced earlier, I believe firmly in collaboration. I don't think there's competition. That's for the lower level. Big picture thinking should have big picture collaboration. And so I've, I've brought in four other uh, trainers, for lack of a word, professional development, uh, employee uh, talent, uh, retention and recruitment, sales, like people all in my world, but don't do what I do. And the five of us are putting on a conference kind of similar to what you've done, Sean, in my research, I realized. It'll be fun. We're calling it Growth X and it's for small businesses in the area and we've got chambers of commerce from different towns who've lined up for us to take our little show on the road and bring it to their community. Sean, how are you thinking about next year? Um, I'm actually maybe a little more measured person <laughs> just in general, but I'm actually feeling better about it. And in a weird way, because I actually think it'll be hard for a lot of businesses. Uh, it's an election year. You know, we've just seen a lot of chaos, right? War in Gaza, war in Ukraine keeps grinding on. But I was thinking about this the other day. We went through a period of time in 2012-ish, 2011, 2012 through 2017, where we grew really fast, 30% a year, 40% a year, and uh, kept you know winning all these awards, fast growth, fast growth. All of that growth, as I reflect back now, it came out of the Great Recession. In other words... Hard times encourage people to think differently about their business and kind of shakes up this kind of status quo thinking. And that's actually good for us. And so I'm, I'm optimistic about next year in terms of people wanting to try something different. I think a lot of us have been in this defensive posture from the pandemic, like, hey, how do I survive this thing? And I think the free money has run out. I think the recognition that you can't just sit around is there. And I think I want to speak into that. So, so I'm optimistic from that, that respect. It's such a great team, best team we've ever had, hands down, no drama, long tenure, just a ton of talent. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah. How about you, Liz? Um, so there's a couple things that I'm really excited about and a couple things that I just need to do that I'm not like hyped up about, which are operational, of course. So, I mean, really the top one is as we expand nationwide, um, we need to set up great, you know, distribution channels. We need to have people to ship product to who will install. So in Aspen and Vail, we have someone that's going to be doing that. But if that's successful, then we're going to replicate in other cities. And another thing is that with 
expansion nationwide, when I'm in other cities, I'm spending more time looking at their trash and looking at their trash problems. And I know it sounds funny, but the thing is, it's like in terms from like an anthropology perspective, I see that in most cities they have alleys and I don't really have a product for alleys. People aren't going to want to spend a lot of money on a trash enclosure, which is a big cabinet. If they're trying to hire, you know, hide dumpsters or trash cans, there might be an opportunity for something less expensive and less, less like an enclosure. So when I was in Aspen recently, I was like walking through these alleys and all the dumpsters, there's such an eyesore in back of really, really expensive homes. So that's uh, you guys will be like, oh, there she goes on another tangent. But the word alleys is always at the top of my head. What am I going to do about alleys? Because I know there's something to do there. And then a the couple things that are less sexy but are important. So as we've expanded our products, we have been, haven't been thinking a lot about product architecture. They've kind of been on the fly. What do we call this thing? And now we have like three different sizes of trash enclosures that don't make sense from a nomenclature perspective. So our smallest one is called a standard. We have a new mid-size that was being called the 2.0 for a long time, and I hated it. And then we have the size extra large, we call it. So those three are, A, confusing to customers, but also are confusing, I think, for anyone trying to sell City Bin, because if you've got three sizes, why not just have small, medium, large? So that's what we're doing. We're shifting as of January 1st, but that does create a huge project because every touch point or every area where we have the late product label, you know, from on the website to our email communications, to even the boxes with the bins in them, with the factory, there's so many places where we need to change that. Um, and so that sort of product architecture is going to be a pretty important thing. And I'm kind of excited for it. It's long overdue, but it's just become more more important. Um, and then the other unsexy thing that I'm doing is we're really trying to get more buttoned up on processes, make sure everybody has job description. We don't have an employee manual. I'm kind of ashamed to say after 12 years in business, we're finally going to be doing that. And, you know, really getting buttoned up on the financials is also going to help with another goal I have in 2024, and that's to, to get evaluation. And I want to be prepped for that. I want to have everything in order. We've never had a valuation done before. It's not because we imminently want to sell the company. It's that we just really want to know what its value is right now. Because Frank and I derive all of our income from the business. And we're really planning on being able to sell it at some point to have a great retirement. Hey, Liz, I'm happy to give you our employee handbook. And you can just cut it apart and use it however you want. I mean, I've spent a fair bit of money on it over the years, but... I do this all the time. You know, there's no reason to start from scratch. Yeah, I will. I will totally take that. Yeah, sure. It'd be great. I'm sure you have many, many more benefits than me. So it'll be a shorter handbook. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I don't know. I, it's less about the benefits and more just about, you know, how to how to kind of act within the company and values, you know. So I, I found that that's really, really helpful to articulate that early and often. And I'm sure you share yep. that that value. Definitely. Sean, have you taken the values and also started to work on a list of behaviors to live through the values? Yeah. So we're really big into the idea of how do you operationalize. A lot of folks pick values because they sound good and then they put them on the kitchen wall of their break room. And then in worst case, then the employees kind of roll their eyes and laugh at them. I mean, that's like the worst case. But but I think most people are in the middle ground, which is they they pick things that sound good. Unfortunately, They pick integrity, excellence, and quality, or some variant of those that aren't actually that remarkable or unique to the business. And so that's phase one is like pick something that's meaningful and then build an operationalization of those values and define what do you mean when you say integrity, which I I would encourage people not to use that one because everybody uses it and it's like a cliche. But so pick something that's actually really good, like, you know, pick a value that's like care about what you're working on. Or think big, you know, that's one of our values. So I I prefer values as verbs uh, instead of nouns. So I make them action oriented, define what they mean, like write a paragraph that talks about what does this value mean? And you can include behaviors in that too. I think the more 
uh, blue collar your business, the more you want to spend energy on being really specific and talk about those behaviors that align with those values. You know, you have a highly educated workforce. You can probably be a little bit more broad there. Yeah, I think that's a great question. What about you? We did. I, I like the way you just phrased that. I'm going to take notes and totally credit you later when I tell my team I had this great idea. Unfortunately, we are out of time. If you want to hear more from these guys, come to Fort Worth in March. My thanks to Sean Bussey, Liz Picarazzi, and Jackie Russo, and to our sponsor, The Great Game of Business, which helps businesses use an open book management system to build healthier companies. You can learn more at greatgame.com. Thanks, everybody. Wait, wait, don't leave yet. If you have a question or a comment that you'd like the 21 Hats owners to address, send it to me by replying to your morning report or by email at lauren at 21hats.com. That's L-O-R-E-N at 21hats.com. Do it now before you forget. And don't be afraid to tell Jay what you really think. He can take it. And if you got something out of this conversation, help us reach more business owners. Tell a friend. Subscribe and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to The Morning Report at 21hats.com. This episode was produced by Jess Duberon, founder of Blank Word Productions. Okay, now you can leave. Thanks for listening, everyone.